Hey besties, how we all doing? My master's dissertation research is supposed to be well underway by now. Huh? And today I wanted to introduce to you the main topic of my research, kind of. Today I want to introduce you all to Exekius. The Exekius painter and potter. He did both. He was very well rounded. As were his pots. Ha <laughs> ha. My research is very much in the beginning stages. Sorry. If you're my supervisor, you did not hear me say that. If you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand in the comments below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. I'll also be leaving my bibliography in the description box below if you would like to read further into Exodus in his life, in his work and stuff. My entire dissertation is about excuse the cringy title, the Ezekian fashion show, how Ezekius used textiles to signify social strata and iconography within the figures that he painted. Not going to cover all that in today's video, obviously. I just want to take you through a brief introduction to Ezekius, who he was, what he kicked about doing and all that fun stuff. I've planned a few many dissertation themed videos just to try and keep myself sane, to be honest, while I write it. But uh, no more lollygagging, let's dive in. So, who was Ezekius when he was at home? What was he up to? When was he active? Where was he about? Ezekius was an Attic black figure, potter and painter, active in Athens from about 545 to 530 BCE, roughly. That's when he was painting, but he was thought to be potting. A little while before that, he started off as a potter and then decided to start painting things. And many scholars consider him to be the greatest Attic black figure painter of all time. Little side note, Attic black figure is painted black silhouette figures on a uh, red clay background or whatever the natural colour of the clay was background and if you invert this process then you get attic red figure painting. But the great thing about my old pal Ezekius is that we actually don't know anything about him. Nout. Zilch. Nil point. But this is mainly because there's no written documentation or literature about any potters at the time really. Pottery was seen as quite a low class industry so even the greater artistic painters were still kind of seen as not the most highbrow of society, shall we say. They were thought of as kind of boring, so they weren't really written about. There's tiny little bits here and there, but there's no particular written evidence that we have just now that says, Oi, this was Ezekiel's workshop, this is who he was, this is what he got up to. The only thing that we actually have to tell us anything about him or his life, or even like the tiniest little shades of his life that we have are the pots that he actually created and painted. I can hear yous already. Why should we care about this? Why is Ezekius so important? I'm going to tell you for why. Ezekius is known for innovative artistry, a lot of images that he is thought to be the first ever creator of. He's also known for his incredible attention to detail in some of his works, oh my word. And most importantly, he signed a lot of his work. Without these signatures, we wouldn't know who Ezekius was, we wouldn't know which pot was attributed to him or not. We wouldn't know that he really likes the Trojans. We would have no evidence for his existence, he would just become another unnamed artistic hand. One of thousands of poor Greek painters who don't have a name anymore because they didn't sign their work. From the works that we have surviving, it's thought that he's signed 13 to 14 of them that we can tell, but over a hundred have been attributed to him in the Beasley Archive. The Beasley Archive is a massive, massive source for me doing this dissertation, and it's basically a database of every single piece of Greek painted pottery ever. The Glaswegian lad himself, John Beasley, pretty much dedicated his life to analysing each of these pieces of pottery, attributing it to a certain artist or their hand or in general just a workshop if it couldn't be put to an actual individual artist. It is online and it is free to look at if you'd like to go have a look, I highly suggest that you do. I'll leave a link to it down below. And there's also a physical archive in Oxford which I'm hoping to get to uh, actually in person to have a look at, that'd be really nice. And this archive includes the known signed works the plus these other attributions. Really John Beasley did not tell anyone what his kind of methodology was, if he even had one, but he basically looked at every single piece of pottery, took the signed ones that he knew were 100% from this painter, for example Ezekius, and then he would compare that to all the other ones, looking at certain styles, the hand shape, the ear shape, stuff like that, and say, oh, these are the same, so they were painted by the same person. Obviously that has its own pitfalls. He could easily have misattributed some, and John Beasley did this for 
all of them not just Exekius for everything everything the only other thing about the Beasley archive worth noting is that it does not account for all of the Greek painted pottery there is a lot that we don't have and that we will probably never have which is awfully sad also within that archive there's a lot of pots that are in fragments so we don't have the full 360 image which could perhaps have a signature on it because the bit with the signatures broke off To show you some example of Exekian artistry, I've picked out my three favourite examples, which I think are the best. You might not agree, but I have a slight attachment to these three. I really like them. Say what you will. There are more. If you don't like them, go have a look for yourself. In no particular order. In no particular order. Let's start off with the Vatican Amphora. It's in the Vatican. This is probably the most famous of Exekius's works ever. And it depicts the two epic heroes Achilles and Ajax playing a board game. Now I'm not going to delve too much into it because I will deep dive into the myth and the lore and the game and everything but I'll try and just be very brief. Exekius was possibly the first person to ever paint this image and it's thought that he was the person who invented this image because this is seen as a calm before the storm moment which is quite a common idea of Exekius's imagery. These two men are in a tent during the Trojan War taking a break from the battle playing a little board game. And this is one of the really cool things that Ezekiel does is pick these images that no one else would really think about. A lot of the images depicted on Greek pottery are the big cool battles or the gods arriving on the scene and you know the interesting parts of the story whereas he likes to pick the more quiet bits that you wouldn't really think about. For example two heroes getting a bit puffed out and deciding you know what let's go let's go play a wee game. Let's just go have a wee breather come back later. Who else would think about that? I think it's cute. Achilles and Ajax were seen as the two greatest Greek warriors. Pretty much always number one and number two. They're often displayed as equals, except Achilles always just has that little slight edge over anyone that he comes across. And that's put forward in this image, where Achilles is the one on the left-hand side with the dominating helmet that kind of curves over the top of the scene. The words that are written their little speech bubbles, another Exekian feature. One of them is saying four and the other is saying three. So again, Achilles is actually beating Ajax at the board game that they're playing. Because you can't beat Achilles. One of the kind of traditions of Attic black figure painting is that in battle scenes and stuff, the loser is painted on the right hand side, the winner's usually on the left. So even in the positioning of Ajax at this side of the image, is in the place of the loser. Painting numero dos, which I would like to talk about, is the Dionysus Kylix. This is probably my favourite of the three, to be honest. I love this thing. A Kylix is a drinking cup, which was often used uh, probably for wine, to be honest. I need to give you a quick little background to the myth behind this one, right? There was a boat full of sailors kicking about on the sea, and Dionysus turned up and was like, You alright there, pal? You alright there, pal? How's it going? I'm Dionysus, and I want you to worship me because I'm a god and I'm really cool and stuff. And the sailors basically said, I right, no you're not. You have to prove it. We're not just going to worship you, you weirdo. How did you get on our boat? And thus Dionysus proves thyself. He proves himself by turning the mast of the ship into a grapevine and turning the sailors into dolphins. On the Kylix, we can see Dionysus reclining on said ship with an overhanging grapevine and lots of little dolphins swimming in the sea. So this is obviously a depiction of that myth. But another little fun fact about this Kylix. The way one would drink from a Kylix, especially using one with these squint handles, it's all kind of a perspective thing, which would be especially crazy if you're drunk. As you would tip the Kylix up to your face and drink the wine, and obviously the wine's going down in front of your face, it looks like his boat is floating on the wine. Isn't that so cool? Wouldn't that be so cool? Why aren't modern cups like that? And I am somewhat of a main ad on a night out as well, I must say. I do enjoy a little drink and a boogie in honour of Dionysus. And to top it all off, this Kylix is signed right round the base with Exekius' signature, telling us that it was that legend that painted it. The third and final example I want to show you is, is trigger warning, mention of unaliving yourself. The suicide of Ajax. Might I just add in here that Ajax deserved so much better. He deserved so much better than what he got. Oh my god, my poor lad. I could write a whole dissertation on why Ajax deserved better. Maybe I should switch my topics. I don't know. A little bit later on in the Trojan War, spoiler warning, after Achilles is finally dead, there was a bit of argy-bargy over who would get Achilles' armour after he died, Odysseus or Ajax, and Odysseus got it because Ajax lost the fight again biggest loser. And then Athena got involved and started meddling, right? 
Athena is a major meddler. She's just sat stirring that pot. She pretty much makes Ajax go crazy. And in this state of frenzy and confusion and craziness, he goes out and he thinks he is in a battle. He thinks he's killing people. He thinks he's going absolutely mad and slaughtering like a whole army. And then he wakes up and Athena goes, look at what you've done, by the way. Look at the state of yourself. And it turns out he has killed all of the livestock that were going to be used to feed the army, his army, his Greek pals. So he's pretty much starved them because he's killed all of their livestock. And he is so ashamed by this that he commits suicide. Because nobody talks about their feelings in the Greek world. As soon as somebody's a wee bit shameful, they're they're going for the suicide. Straight away they're like, oh, what shame, I have to go kill myself now. But once again, Exekius has to make his image extra special and different. Previous depictions, for example, uh, there's a few Corinthian ones out there, usually showed him already dead and with a couple people surrounding him to kind of prove that he's dead and to go clean up the mess. Whereas Exekius decides to paint him still alive and by himself, completely alone. It's a very solemn and sad image, really. Ajax is curled into a ball, he's setting up the sword to then throw himself on shortly after He's completely stripped off his armour, so there's no way that that's going to stop anything. He's just accepting his death. A little lonely palm tree that just shows that he is outside, surrounded by absolutely nothing. But one we take away from this that's actually nice is that Ajax himself is actually finally standing on the right side of the image. So even when he was kind of still a loser, he finally won something. Which is still a shame and I still think he deserved better, but he just, he has to take what he can get. To wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about Exekius' legacy and how his skills and his craft was handed on down through the ages and stuff, or was it? From what we can tell, after the career of Exekius, Attic Black figure kind of takes a nosedive. It's on a steady decline until it's eventually replaced altogether by the new rising Attic Red figure. Long story short, Red figure is the inversion of the Black figure technique. We don't know where Exekius's workshop was, and we certainly don't know the inner workings of that workshop, but it's thought that Exekius had two, sorry, two students, Andocades and Lysipides. Lysipides continued on the Black figure technique, although he didn't quite do it as good as Exekius, I'm not gonna lie to you. Whereas Andocades is considered to be the inventor of this Attic Red figure, technique, or at least one of the pioneers of that technique coming into play. The best example for both of these lads is this bilingual amphora. A bilingual amphora is an amphora which employs two different artistic techniques. In the case of this one, black figure on one side, red figure on the other side. Remember the Vatican amphora I mentioned a bit earlier? This is a copy of it. One side is painted in black figure, one side is painted in red figure. And it's thought that Andocades and Lysipides collaborated to create this, and one painted one side, one painted the other in their preferred styles. This is great for showing both their methodological differences, but also their stylistic differences. To me, it looks like one of them is painted to Achilles's and one of them is painted to Ajax's. Their attention to detail is also quite similar to Ezekiel's, but not quite the same level of detail. And also they're quite different from each other, but they also complement each other in a way. But again, we don't know how this vessel came about. This could have been in homage to their teacher. It could have been that Ezekiel's plonked a blank vase in front of them and said, one of these paint one side, one of these paint the other, copy this image that I've already made and let's see how well you do it as like a teaching exercise. Or it could have been that these two had no connection to Ezekiel's whatsoever. They were just copying his image for whatever reason. But these two are often thought to have worked together and used both of their styles on the same pot. Not just this example, this is just probably the best example of this. But of course, this is not without its own controversies. There's a massive debate over the existence of Andocades and Lysipides and how close they were to Exekius, if at all, or if he maybe had more students, or maybe they were not connected in any way, shape or form. And it was just a case of art inspiring art inspiring art inspiring art. So to round off with a couple of conclusions, Exekius is a pretty cool artist, am I right? We don't know much about him, but we know a little bit more about him than we do with other artists and that we know that he possibly had connections to a wider workshop and apprentices and stuff. And he's obviously very, very skilled at what he does, potting and painting. If Andocades and Lysipides were in fact his students, I don't think either of them, from what I've seen so far, 
remember my my research isn't done i need to do research into those two and further into exegius and stuff there's definitely elements there that are similar to exegius but i don't think either of them could quite grasp the level of detail and emotion in their imagery that he did i just think i just think he'd done it like no other and although that they were learning from the best neither of them could quite get their work to the same level which is maybe why Andocades invented a whole new thing this video of course is not my entire dissertation my dissertation is going to look even further into Ezekiel's art and textiles. So expect more videos very, very soon, all relating to my final dissertation. <laughs> because I don't have enough room in my brain. This is my notes that I'm taking. But there you go. I hope you've learned something about Ezekiel or his students or Attic black figure painting or just Greek pottery in general if you had never came into contact with it before. Hope you learned something. If not, watch it again. If you do have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section below. I will get back to you as soon as I can. I will leave the bibliography I used specifically for this video in the description box below if you'd like to have a look at that. But of course, this being my dissertation topic, I have a lot more bibliography if you'd like to read more about it. So just let me know in the comments. But I will leave it all in the description box below alongside my other social media links, including Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, no. Twitch, where I stream once or twice a week, and my Discord as well. So you're always welcome to hop on to Twitch when I'm live and ask a question live there. That's pretty fun. Or if you would prefer to not ask a question straight out on YouTube, maybe you're a bit shy or whatever, you're welcome to jump into my Discord and ask it privately there. Thank you so, so much again for watching. Don't forget to like the video if you liked it, or like it if you don't, because it's nice to be nice, and subscribe as well if you really want to. Tatty bye, I'm a little workshop apprentices and I shall see you all next Tuesday slash Wednesday. Have a good one. Bye.